would like to invite Willie Chi back up. Uh, Willie's going to uh, provide us a broad overview of uh, screening for stroke risk. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, don't have any jokes to tell this afternoon. Sorry, I was with the kids all morning. Uh, so I'm a little tired, OK? So give me a break. All right. Uh, I was given this task about talking about screening for stroke risk. Uh, when Dave Dawson gave me this topic, I sort of almost had a heart attack because, uh, I mean, where do I go from here? Uh, but I am going to go. Um, I don't have any disclosure regarding to this particular talk. Uh, just like Dr. Devon had uh, mentioned, that uh, stroke is, uh, certainly could be devastating. And uh, we know that stroke is the second uh, most commonly occurred cardiovascular uh, causes of uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, and the definition of it really is, I, mean, I really don't have to go into this, is that it's any type of disruption of blood flow going to the brain due to disease or the blood vessel. Uh, typically, we characterize those into two, uh, ischemic, uh, which we all are fairly aware of, and obviously hemorrhagic, uh, which Holly's uh, mom went through. And then for the ischemic stroke, uh, we always talked about cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, it comprises most of the stroke, about 85%. And the hemorrhagic stroke uh, is really related to age, uh, obviously, 46 is quite young for hemorrhagic stroke, but certainly could happen, and hypertension as well as amyloid angiopathy. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke it comprises only a small portion of the overall uh, stroke, uh, what I call pizza pie. Now, if we were to look at the stroke belt, um, Sacramento is here. So we're actually pretty fairly good. Now, obviously, two months ago, I was over here. So I saw a lot of stroke, and, and believe me, there, there are a lot of stroke uh, uh, down south, and certainly it's uh, due to uh, genetics, uh, maybe diet, maybe lifestyle changes. Uh, and I think that that certainly uh, has a lot to say with uh, one's overall risk of having a stroke. Now, like I was uh, mentioning about the two main types of stroke, whether that be ischemic or hemorrhagic, and my focus for the remainder of the talk is primarily in the, in the ischemic part because obviously there's something we could do about them. You know, once, uh, once there's bleeding in the brain, I mean, pretty much there's blood in the brain, you know, and, and the neurosurgeon had to get involved. You know, obviously none of, I don't think that there, there are any neurosurgeons in the room, is there, John? I doubt it, right? No neurosurgeon has signed up for this course. So, so, so I think that our, uh, our uh, expertise really in the, in the ischemic part. And then within the ischemic stroke types, um, you know, there is lacuna, there's the cryptogenic, in which pretty much most of us have seen. And then obviously you have carotid stenosis, others, which I don't know what others mean. And then obviously cardioembolic. Now, I could have ended this talk with this slide here. This is actually something I downloaded from uh, University of Delaware online. Uh, service, and it basically has all the risk factors set. Uh, but I would be doing you all a disservice if I ended as that. So I've been, I'm going to be talking about some of these main risk factors I think that we should know about, and some of the novel risk factors I think that's going to be up and coming uh, down the line that has to do with uh, the laboratory analysis. Now, if we were to look at stroke risk, men has more stroke than women, except for that age group that Holly had mentioned. Uh, and obviously, that we can see that at the older you get, doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man, the higher the risk of you having a stroke. Now, this is, some, uh, this is a, a study came from the Framingham Heart data. It uh, was published over uh, two dec almost two decades ago, looking at uh, hypertension. You know, obviously, we all know that hypertension is a risk factor for stroke. But do you know that the patients, while on medication, but yet do not have their blood pressure control, actually have a higher risk of stroke than those who are not taking medication yet have a diagnosis of hypertension. See, that's interesting. So it has to do maybe with you know, the lifestyle, that maybe the patients are not taking the drug as they should. So compliance has a lot to do with it. Now, um, again, coming from the Framingham uh, Heart Study uh, out of Boston and looking at men and women and the risk factor stroke. And uh, I'm not sure if you could see these numbers in the back, but I sort of underlined the red one uh, where when their relative risk is over two, as you can see that pretty much all the risk factors are, are definitely over one. But in particular in, in, the, in the male population, LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, certainly a, uh, a risk factor that should not be ignored. In women, H, um, obviously LVH, atrial fibrillation, 
this is the main risk factor. Now, we talk about these other risk factors such as CVD or actually in this case would be you know, cardiovascular disease is a risk factor, but LVH actually uh, has a lot to do with the stroke risk in men as well as in women. Now, uh, the study was actually reconfirmed by the, the Boston study looking at both men and women, um, looking at the risk factors. As you can see here, antihypertensive therapy in men, and this actually has to do with what I just mentioned that uh, while they are on medication, if they have a diagnosis of hypertension and on medication, but yet do not have their blood pressure control, they actually have a much higher risk. Because think about it, if they're on medication, yet their blood pressure is not under control. That means that had they not taken that medication, guess what? Their blood, should, their blood pressure will be a lot higher. So, so again, uh, it, re it reiterates the fact about compliance, about patient education, about follow-up, and the importance of, uh, of nursing. Uh, in, the, in the collaborative effort in treating these patients. Uh, these other ones, uh, as we um, already mentioned before, atrial fibrillation, you know, left ventricular hypertrophy, you know, in men and women, obviously the atrial fibrillation risk uh, in this particular group is almost eightfold uh, in the women population, so certainly a major risk factor. Now, just like we have a Framingham score for the heart, we also have a Framingham score for stroke, too. I'm not sure if you're all, you, all of you are aware of that. And then it depends on your age, and you could plus the points, and then it depends on where the blood pressure lies, uh, both the systolic, actually the systolic untreated and treated systolic uh, blood pressure on the bottom here, uh, diabetes, uh, cigarette smoking, uh, CVD. You could just add the points together. As you can see here, if you have 11 points, and those are the bottom graph. If you have 11 points, that puts you at a 10-year probability of stroke at 11%. But after that, as you can see, the number basically logarithmically escalates. And the same thing applies to women, okay? Um, the, the more numbers, the more of these risk factors you have, the more, the higher the probability of stroke over that 10-year period of time. Now, I just added this slide in because uh, I think it was fun. Um, again, reiterate the fact that if you are a woman and you have diabetes, you have uh, systolic, uh, systolic uh, blood pressure elevation, if you smoke and you have atrial fibrillation, guess what? Your percent of risk of ischemic stroke in 10 years is one-third. So 100 patients, well, guess what? 30 of them will have a stroke by the 10-year period. Now, let's talk about other risk factors. Well, carotid stenosis, we all know that. Uh, carotid stenosis defined by uh, pixel cell velocity. You know, for those of us who are in the room, uh, certainly knows that the higher if you pixel uh, systolic velocity, uh, that translates to the, the tighter the stenosis. And as you can see, that the tighter the stenosis, the more likely you're going to have a stroke. And this will be ipsilateral stroke. This will be transient ischemic attack. And this is any type of stroke. Now, having said that, based on literature that does have published in, uh, in the surgical literature, such as NASA, ECAS, and ACAS, that asymptomatic stenosis really is a risk factor. Now, however, in this study, we looked at, uh, actually the surgeons looked at uh, asymptomatic carotid stenosis in the elderly patient, those greater than 70 and those less than 70. Well, guess what? Asymptomatic stenosis is a much higher risk factor in those who are older than 70 and those who have hypertension. Then you ask the question, well, is it really the asymptomatic stenosis or these other risk factors, the age or the hypertension? So the, the follow-up graph is to, um, is, risk, uh, is risk factor adjusted? And looking at the risk factor adjusted graph, the tighter your stenosis, the higher risk of your uh, stroke. So it is an independent risk factor. Now this is, uh, again, based on surgical literature. Um, you know, a lot of these names that uh, I'm pretty sure that everybody in the room is aware of, including Norm Hersey from Cleveland. Um, the, the tighter of your stenosis, your annual stroke rate increases. The only caveat to this is the one that published in 1993 about Hobson, which has sort of have a decrease, and I really can't explain that. But overall, CAD and carotid stenosis, there is a correlation. You know, CAD, we, we, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, uh, certainly is a uh, risk factor and, uh, for carotid stenosis and also stroke. And that cardiac disease, current smoking, and hypertension certainly is a predictor of having uh, carotid stenosis. Now, unfortunately, based on what we know of, based on science, you know, published uh, both in the medical and the surgical literature, that the society we became to dread and fear, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, basically refused, and they refused 
to allow screening for carotid stenosis. They gave carotid screening a grade D, okay? Now, I don't want to go into ABI because they also refuse having ABI as a screening tool, and, and I know that certainly um, some, of the author, some of the speakers in the room have written um, stuff to the U.S. Preventative uh, Task Force about these particular issues, but they actually published in the Annals of Internal Medicine about the fact that we should not screen for carotid stenosis, and, I, and to this day, I could still not figure out why. And the reason behind it is because they're saying that the harm always the benefit, that there's too many false positives. Well, believe it or not, it's not their fault, it's our fault. And what, that, what this means is that we need to do a better effort in identifying the level of carotid stenosis. So the vascular lab, the guys who do vascular lab, the ICFO accredited agency really need to come up with some tool to better define exactly how to use the lab in this particular setting. Because otherwise, just like you know, Dr. Uh, Krishna Roksin was mentioning before, if we don't do our job right, we're not going to get reimbursed because CMS is going to come down saying that we don't have evidence or proof. Now, what about PAD? Well, PAD is my field. And PAD and stroke events, well, believe it or not, it has not been strongly correlated or published. You, well, you ask what, what's the reason for that? Well, it's because not a lot of people are doing PAD and stroke work. Now, in this particular study, uh, they simply asked the patient a question that do you have PAD? If you do have PAD, you document it. If you don't have PAD, it says no. And what they have done was simply look at those questionnaires. PAD, those who answer, yes, I have PAD, actually have a much higher event rate. This is actually event-free, so the lower the, the curve, the, that means that they have the higher event, that those who report that I have PAD have a higher uh, event rate or overall vascular event rate, mean, including cardiovascular, you know, uh, coronary, cerebral vascular. But in terms of stroke, there's really no difference. The next thing I w I'm going to talk about is CRP. You know, we all know that, uh, we all know who Paul Redeker is. He has his hands into everything that we do uh, nowadays, including uh, venous stone embolism I was mentioning. But uh, Paul also have his hands in the stroke arena. So what he did was he looked at CRP and thromboembolic stroke. And what he did was he, he basically quantified the CRP level into quartiles, one, two, and three, and four. And looking at these risk factors, CRP as a risk factor in terms of predicting stroke. And what he did find is that, that at the higher of your quartile, that the higher or higher incidence or percentage of stroke, which somewhat makes sense. Well, do you, then you ask the question, well, there's so many risk factors. Well, he did the next step because he already answered that question. He risk adjusted based on age and risk factors. And guess what? He still came up positive. So CRP is becoming an independent risk factor for stroke. Now this slide actually makes my life easy because as we all know that vascular disease overlaps, uh, oftentimes uh, all we need to do is treat one vascular disease and that treatment of that one vascular disease will also treat other vascular disease because atherosclerosis does not discriminate which vascular bed it affects. In this particular case, as you can see, there's somewhat overlap between uh, ischemic heart um, PAD as well as, uh, um, as well as cerebrovascular disease. Now, having said that, please don't forget that there is an ethnic difference between everyone that's in the room. I am Asian, I'm from Taiwan, and this was a study that was published almost uh, two, dec two decades ago from the Veterans Hospital in Taipei. And what the investigator uh, did was they simply compared their data to the ones that was published in China as well as, Jap uh, as, well as Japan, and then using the study from France, U uh, Alabama, US, as well as UK and Liberia. And looking at their stroke rate and what type of stroke do the patient population have? Well, lo and behold, there is a, a good amount of ischemic stroke, but the Asian population, if you were to focus on the Japanese, the, uh, the Chinese population, as well as the, the Taiwanese population, that the Asians do get a lot, of, a lot more hemorrhagic stroke than ischemic stroke. And the reason, because, the reason for that is because there probably is a lot more hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension in, the, in that particular group population. 
Now, what about CIMT? Well, CIMT stands for carotid uh, intermediate thickness. For those of us who uh, do laboratory work, certainly have used this as a tool to, uh, to risk assess um, cardiovascular patients. Now, this is not reimbursed, unfortunately, so a lot of times that this was uh, sort of a freebie, depends on which lab you go to. But if we were to look at the ones, this meta-analysis, and focusing only the ones that deal with strokes, such as the ROD or the CAP study, and looking at their, their, C, their CIMT uh, anywhere from 1.18 millimeter to uh, uh, anywhere from um, 1.81 to 1.18 millimeter, and looking at the relative risk, there is a change. The risk is anywhere from 1.4 to uh, 3.0, and actually 3.5. And this is actually the most, uh, this is the highest risk I've seen and was published by Kitamura um, as group in, uh, in Tokyo. Now, what about ERIC? Well, ERIC is a major CIMT study. I'm pretty sure that a lot of us are aware of the ERIC study. And then within the ERIC, there's MI, but uh, there's also a stroke population. And what they used was a CIMT of one millimeter in size. And then looking at uh, the relative risk in terms of stroke and looking at the data for men, it's, uh, um, for male, it's, two, it's actually twofold relative risk increase, and for women, it's 3.3. Now, what about homocysteine and stroke? Well, homocysteine is really one of these moderate risk factors that we really don't know what to do of. I mean, it basically affects all the vascular beds, you know, venous, you know, arterial. But homocysteine and stroke, um, really, it's relevant to, to a certain point. And in this particular study, um, that homocysteine is really relevant as a, as a reflection of age. So the younger you are, okay, and then if you have a stroke, then you really need to think about homocysteine as a risk factor. But so are these other hypercoag states, which we have to consider. Uh, what about vitamin B and stroke? Well, this is a um, meta-analysis um, looking at these different, uh, uh, different uh, trials. And vitamin B really has no difference than compared to placebo in terms of uh, stroke risk uh, reduction. And what about vitamin E? Well, this was actually a recently published uh, article in BMJ um, just a couple months ago, looking again at, at main analysis of all these major trials uh, f uh, almost a decade ago, over 100,000 patients, and vitamin E actually causes more stroke. But it's not any stroke, but hemorrhagic stroke. So for those of us who think that vitamin E could cure stroke, well, go ahead and forget that. Tell your patient not to take vitamin E for stroke prevention, because they may end up having a stroke. And this is actually a slide I was actually supposed to be put under that homocysteine slide, uh, simply because that for somebody at a younger age who do not have cardiovascular risk factor yet develop a uh, massive uh, ischemic event, including stroke, you really need to think about these other weird phenomena, such as homocysteine, such as antiphospholipid syndrome, such as um, you know, protein CNS. Factor V and prothrombin gene mutation is really not in the arterial arena. Uh, it's primarily in the venous arena, but they did mention it, and uh, especially in the pediatric population. I certainly have not seen any pediatric stroke with a positive factor V or, uh, or um, prothrombin gene mutation. So this is my last slide. How to string for stroke? Well, I hope I have left you with more questions than answers. Uh, like I did for my last talk because I want you to think about uh, these questions because that's how we improve ourselves. So in terms of how to screen for stroke, it's really a physician experience and preferences. Um, depends on your particular population, what type of patient you're seeing. And like I was mentioning, Asian population may have a higher prevalence of hemorrhagic stroke than ischemic stroke compared to the Caucasian population. And obviously, cardiovascular risk factor identification and reduction. And for the two main factors I was mentioning about CRP, carotid stenosis, and CIMT, uh, hopefully those are the things that you could incorporate into your, your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.